So as you're going through the process of Paul, and as you're looking at how he's breaking down how his age is defining the Messiah character, and especially the main character from the already existing Jesus movement, makes you wonder, is this legit? Um, despite you know, looking at all of the colorful instances of his terminologies and the mythology and the theology connecting all of that together, the links, the, the trees of family, the the adoption of a figure into his two uh, deity system. It makes you wonder uh, um, the legitimacy of this. And what I love about the Bible what I love studying about the philosophy and the mind that is within the Bible is how it educates. Well, okay. Well, how I have been educated from within the scriptures. And so from within the scriptures, I have been learning what is legitimate. And then after learning what is legitimate, my studies within the scriptures always turn to what is illegitimate. So I always have a background of what is legitimate so that I can weigh what I am now coming across that is appearing fraudulent from what is first mentioned um, within the scriptures. And so I'm saying all of that because months ago, uh, reviewing the foundational philosophy of justification, um, what it means to be justified from a terminology sense and then from a philosophical sense according to the mind that is within the Bible. And so now looking at how Paul is defining justification uh, through the now divine blood of a human being taken and ascended up to be high priest at the right hand of God the Father, knowing beforehand in episodes before that the Bible doesn't define justification in this manner, um, knowing from episodes before that there is already, according to the Bible's mind, a high priest at the Lord God's right hand, not at the God, God the Father's hand, God the Father and the Lord God Almighty of the Bible. These are two different uh, chief figures. Their temples are two different sanctuaries and their high priests are two different high priests. So seeing all of this and then looking at how Paul's mythology and theology has entered into the fray to disrupt what has taken uh, place before. It makes you wonder what's what's going on here, because there are two different worlds warring against one another. And that's really the main point when you think about it. Um, if you just take this philosophy of Paul and put it into its context and into its into the day in which it is given, you can actually see a, a social reason for it. There's a political reason for it, sure. There's a propaganda attached to that. There is a philosophical reason for it. There's also propaganda attached to that. But there is a social reason for why this um, manner of understanding the Messiah according to Paul's school of thought matters. And that social reason is, is that there is, even to this day at this point in time, a society wanting God to do something for them that they're not willing to do for themselves and that they know they can't do for themselves as human beings innately. So Paul's philosophy, it encompasses a deity, an, an ideal deity, that's willing to do for human beings what the human being can't do for themselves. Only thing is, the work isn't over. The human being still has a work to do. You have to maintain a lifestyle a lifestyle um, granting you permission to have this ideal deity in your life. And if you can maintain that lifestyle, and if you can maintain the, the crux and the core uh, of that lifestyle in service, as Paul would, would put it, to the love of God, and this is God the Logos, in service to the, the love of the Logos, well, then you can have everything that this ideal deity will do and has done for you, as opposed to the former, which is a, a different setup, a different um, exercising of self. Remaining with my community will say Paul, will say Paul, or what Paul would say, 
You can have everything freely given to you. But is this legitimate? Justification as a subject revolves around justifying the conversation. And when it comes to this subject of justification, I have specifically chosen to revolve it around Isaiah 53, 11. Isaiah 53, 11, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Now that's part, that's part B of that verse. Part B of that verse. Part A says, he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Part B comes in and then says, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. So part A, he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Paul is correct because you can't have justification without suffering. You can't have justification without um, travail. And specifically, the travail of the soul. The soul must be aggravated in order for one to experience and enter into the experience of justification. It's just that, although Paul is right, well, there are two aspects to see this. There is the one that Paul is putting forward, and then there is the one that Bible is putting forward. When Paul sees this verse, Paul sees this verse uh, being well-versed, um, absolutely well-versed in Greek literature, in Greek rhetoric, and in Greek uh, philosophy, and in the Greek mythology. It also from the all of that with it, within Tarsus, and then all of that also within Hellenistic Judaism, because his school of thought is Hellenistic Judaism. When he's seeing all of this, um, plus this within the verse, the travail of the soul, and then the satisfaction from that, and then after that it says, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, Paul is rightly seeing that the knowledge of that suffering uh, virtuous servant this knowledge comes from part a which is the travail of the soul and the satisfaction to be found in that so paul is right to understand that it is through suffering the soul it is through suffering the soul that one enters into the classroom of redemption in the classroom of salvation the thing is is these terms get twisted once you enter into the Greek context and exit the, the Bible context. I'm just keeping language here simple. When you enter into the Greek context, the, the, the language there for salvation changes because it's not about the inward. It's not about mind. It's not about what is to be mentally satisfying to the conversation, which is the Bible's general context. It's now about what is mythologically satisfying um, to the impulse within the spirituality. So now instead of healing occurring within, now you have a form of healing occurring without, yet somehow manifesting within and extending outward. So when Paul is seeing this, he's not wrong, because this is what the Bible is saying. The only thing is, is that the context matters. And when you strip away the context of this verse from itself, and especially from the things that are surrounding it, and then you enter into the Greek context, and you're 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 doing what Philo did. You're allegorizing um, the scriptures from the past through Greek methodology, but you're taking away the essence. You're taking away the essence, and you're taking away the point. And so the question now becomes: What travail is legitimate travail? Is Paul's travail right? Or is the Bible's travail right? Paul's travail is suffering for, and le let that be whatever that may be, because Paul is not really giving a, a you know instruction on this. His characters are allegorical and his, his characters are imaginary. So you have to live your life according to the logos. How you see that, that's how you live that. How you see the logos, that's how you live the logos. You can imagine what the logos is and does, being the creator of all things from looking and see how, how everything is so consistent and so precise and filled with love and doing benefits for one another outside of the human uh, cause. The Logos constructed that. So for suffering the cause of the Logos, if you're a human being, you want to do the same thing. And by doing the same thing, this is how then you enter into salvation to receive the same privilege of Paul's Lord, of Paul's Christ. 
But is this is this legitimate? Again, I'm I'm asking, is this legitimate to the cause within the Bible? case when is suffering uh, travail for virtue when is suffering travail for virtue in Paul's case the individual needs to reach the height of virtue the height of virtue was sealed by the son of God who is the logos the logos is the son of God the father the son of God entered into a human host. And when within that human host, that human host filled with the Son of God, the Father, that human host became the Son of God, the Logos, by way of infiltration and by way of the release of the spirit of the Logos within the human host. And how that host lived, well, this is the now prime example of what leads into salvation because that individual suffered and by suffering whatever he suffered for that cause of god the father and of god the logos together logos shows him release within him the essence of the logos and allowed him to fall into the pair of the of god the father and god the son the logos to receive precious divine promises divine precious promises and a fulfillment of an experience to where now once he died he can no longer die anymore he's resurrected and to be with that pair forever so this is paul's example paul's example is to suffer for the same cause that that example that that human host suffered for how you do so you use what you have and what you believe uh intelligently and spiritually whether that means the profession of a martyr which became famous or whether that means being hungry, which became famous, whatever that means to you to suffer for the cause of God, the Logos, which is love. Well, however you define love to the Corinthians, it was having intercourse with one another, whether they were male or female, whether you were a man doing it with a man, a woman doing it with a woman, husband doing it with another husband, a wife doing it with another husband that wasn't hers. This is the Corinthian case. Paul had to correct this, but however you're seeing love, and however you're imagining the Logos to administer love and to grant you permission to do that love, well, then that's how salvation is. And you do that because that's how the our example, that's how the original example to this experience lived. He lived for love. He may not have done the strange acts of love, but nevertheless, there's a whole slew of things that we can get past that to remain on the track of grace and continue to chase that love of the logos for the hope of that resurrection on the day of redemption or the day of atonement sorry day of redemption and so that's paul's view but is that bible view to labor for a love of the logos of god the logos and in doing so keeping a figurative imagination a figurative image of who that human host is that the logos occupied and living the life uh, personal and devotional according to that image that is portrayed is this bible well in the bible the soul is equivalent to the mind i've reviewed this i'm not going to review that again but the soul is equivalent to the mind and in context the mind is equivalent to the character of the conversation so when travail is mentioned in this context within the bible the suffering is not necessarily human suffering is, is what Paul is trying to get at here. The human needs to suffer for the cause of virtue. In the Bible, the sufferer is the conversation, the mind of the character of the conversation, and it is the mind of the character of the conversation that must have virtue. Proverbs 2, 1 through 7 
Proverbs 2, 1 through 7 reads, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. So, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. What's separating this, indivi this individual as a righteous servant is the fact that he is a getter and a chaser and an exerciser of wisdom. He is suffering his soul for wisdom. And that's pretty much the correct context of what that travail means. So Philo's breakdown of Moses, which we reviewed some episodes ago, but uh, Philo's breakdown of Moses how Moses at this time, and again, this is not, this is Hellenistic Judaism. This is the school of Hellenistic Judaism that Philo is attached to and that is popular at this time. The other form of Judaism at this time, it's not where Philo's coming from. I'm saying this because when Philo is seeing Moses, Philo is seeing somebody that is chasing virtue. It is through virtue that Moses is chosen to lead the Exodus. It is through virtue that when others saw Moses, they couldn't decide if, if he was all human because his mind was so beyond all of the others. He was divinely touched and inspired by something greater than others around him. He shined more than them. And then Philo even makes the note of, well, this is why his face had to be veiled when he saw the people because he shined more than them due to the wisdom and, or due to the virtue from the wisdom that he had and that he exercised in private before all of this took place. So now he can dwell in the presence of a higher virtue. So when it comes to this aspect of travail, when it comes to this aspect of suffering, Bible has it that when one is honoring their understanding of the philosophy that is within, that is within the scriptures, of the mind that is within the scriptures, when one is um, experiencing that level of connection, the virtue that is to be attained is primarily for this. It is this kind of virtue that one should be um, suffering themselves for. Why? In the book of Psalm 72, 13 and 14, Psalm 72, 13 and 14, it reads, He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. Verse 14. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Now, this isn't literal. Everything here is figurative. The poor and the needy, the saving, the redemption, the deceit, the violence, and the blood. This is all figurative language. It's all figurative language pointing to an experience that is held, um, of course, You'll go through some things that will lead to these things and make these things true. But in all actuality, this is for what is within. Redemption to the Bible's mind, we, as we've seen um, time, time prior, but redemption to the Bible's mind has nothing to do with human being, uh, human offense. Human offense isn't the concern within the Bible because human offense is actually needed um, by the, the mind um, inspiring creation by the mind that created human offense is actually needed because it's through human offense that correction is given that from that correction it is a right pattern of personal and devotional health that is to be uh, acquired and then exercised so it is wisdom this wisdom of exercising in a personal sense but firstly or primarily in a devotional sense how to connect oneself with the mind that is within the scriptures and taking that connection uh, outward. This wisdom, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. The Bible is linking the righteous to wisdom. The Bible is linking the righteous to wisdom. So by the knowledge of this wise minister, by the knowledge of this wisdom's minister, many shall be justified. Justification 
is not necessarily through suffering the human being for a natural cause or through suffering the human being for a cause of impulse uh, within the human being, for suffering the human being to escape somehow the, the plight of its condition. Justification is actually an exercise acknowledging and plunging into the plight of the human being personally by acquiring an understanding of it to get past it uh, patiently and temperately and that understanding because there is nothing naturally within the human being for it to help itself the human being is as confused within itself as anything else a higher form of understanding needs to enter within to it for it to help itself and the bible gives that higher understanding a name called Emmanuel. Once Emmanuel is entered, now the human being has something to weigh its conscience against, and the process can move forward from there. Whether a pastor or a church leader or a ministry volunteer, or whether the work is going on within and that it's personal, your soul temple being cared for, Church Source is your online source for everything that you need to make your journey and your ministry prosperous. Head on over to my website to click the affiliate links. They will take you to Church Source where you will be able to see and to discover the resources that will help you make your journey and your ministry thrive. When one is suffering for wisdom and when one is suffering for the cause that the mind within the Bible advocates for, this is how we silently enter into a covenant pact or a covenant agreement with the philosophy that the scriptures are influencing our experience by. Example, Isaiah 59, 21. Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and Forever. So notice here the context of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Bible uh, likes to teach uh, from within the verse that it's that it's giving. My Spirit that is upon thee, part A. My words which I have put in thy mouth, part B. These two parts they equate the same thing. When Spirit is upon, words are within. When spirit is upon, words are within. This is the correct context of understanding what it means to be filled with uh, spirit. Um, Proverbs 1, 22 and 23, just to seal this. Proverbs 1, 22 and 23. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So in Paul's case, this, this literally proves... Paul's, um, the beginning part of Paul's theory false, which then allows the rest of it to crumble. In Paul's case, Paul is seeing the travail of the soul as one being chosen to receive the spirit of the Logos. In Paul's case, receiving the spirit of the Logos means having a divine entity enter in past the human flesh and going in to the body and dwelling within there, housing within there. This is how Paul is seeing the outpouring of God the Father's Spirit. Well, the thing is, is that that's how God the Father works. But that's not how the living God works. That's not how the mind inspiring the Bible works. When the outpouring of the mind uh, inspiring the Bible takes place, words are actually what takes place within. So in the Greek context in which Paul is attacking this from, it is an entity, a supernatural extraterrestrial entity, entering into a human being, becoming the host or the human being hosting that, and then doing what he's going to do, die, rise, and then do all of this with his blood and high priestly things. So that's not how the Bible operates, and that's not legitimate if we're going to stay within the conscience, within the scriptures. According to the Bible, the outpouring of that spirit means an outpouring of words. So by suffering... And this allows us to, to know that what, the, what this man suffered was not his human being um, primarily, was not his, what we would call soul in a secular sense. This individual suffered his mind. 
He suffered his mind and suffered the travail of his mind and received the outpouring of words in which the Bible terms outpouring of spirit. It is because he suffered his mind. It is because he suffered for the for virtue, you could say, for the virtue of the understanding within the, uh, within the scriptures, the philosophy that the mind inspiring the Bible has. This individual suffered himself to do so. And by doing so, he was given the opportunity to understand more than the rest. This is all mental activity. This is nothing special, phenomenal. This is an individual having a concern within himself, taking that concern and engaging that concern and allowing that concern to fuel his desire. As the Proverbs say, he cried after knowledge and understanding and received the fear of the living God. He received that knowledge. He received that wisdom. And by that wisdom, he was set apart. And this is the general foundation of what the um, anticipated Messiah's career is. The spirit of understanding shall rest on him, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of might, the spirit of counsel. So Paul deviates in an illegitimate way. And the process of justification is a process of what the Bible is actually saying here. Deceit and violence is devotional, is religious. Justification is the process from getting away from devotional lies, from devotional deceit, from devotional violence against the conscience, both personal or human and devotional, to understand a more suitable wisdom for our human being and for our devotional conversation. So this is justification. And in the scope of Paul's reference, it really doesn't stand true um, to the mind inspiring the scriptures. And that's something that we need to know.